following films are presented in chronological order. Debuting in 1962 in Dr. No, Sean Connery, cigarette dangling from his lips, revealed his name to sultry Sylvia Trench, and he had us at Bond, James Bond. For the first time, author Ian Fleming's British secret agent electrified the big screen and has since become a cultural phenomenon. The first in 24 films to date, 007 The Spy with a License to Kill has since been portrayed by six actors, from Sean Connery to Daniel Craig. Nobody does it better than Bond. My name is Bond. 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 James, James Bond. Bond. This is Mad About Superheroes, favorite James Bond film. Number 10, Goldfinger. Goldfinger, he's the man, the man with the Midas touch. The film where Connery first ordered a martini shaken and not stirred. The first of three times Shirley Bassey would belt out the theme songs for the films. She also sang the title tunes for Diamonds Are Forever and Moonraker. And Bond got his first tricked out Aston Martin from Q. The gadgets introduced in Goldfinger were a harbinger of things to come for future Bond films. This time, 007 tested his mettle against the villainous Auric Goldfinger. Highly acclaimed critically, Goldfinger starred Bond girls Honor Blackman as pilot Pussy Galore and Shirley Eaton as the ill-fated Jill Masterson, who succumbed to death by gold paint. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Number nine, you only live twice. You only live twice, or so it seems. When an American man's spacecraft mysteriously vanishes, foul play is suspected of the Soviets. Bond is dispatched to Japan after a mysterious crash in the sea. Disguised as a Japanese businessman, Bond learns the space mission was scuttled by Spectre mastermind Ernest Stavro Blofeld, played to perfection by Donald Pleasance. Though Bond trying to pass as a Japanese businessman is incredibly silly, the first appearance of Donald Pleasance as Blofeld more than makes up for it. You Only Live Twice and Blofeld served as inspiration for the Austin Powers film series. Shot mostly in Japan, when Connery, who valued his privacy above all, had an unpleasant encounter with a crazed fan, trying to get a photo. Connery hastily announced that he wouldn't be doing another Bond film, though in actuality he'd return to the role two more times. I think I will enjoy very much serving under you. For your appeal, you are exceptionally cultivated. You will see that my piranha fish get very hungry. They can strip a man to the bone in 30 seconds. Bon appetit. I've got you now. Well, enjoy yourself. James Bond, allow me to introduce myself. I am Ernst Stavro Blofeld. They told me you were assassinated in Hong Kong. Yes, this is my second wife. You only live twice, Mr. Bond. All the things I do for England. He's a gentleman. All we can do now is wait and pray. Kill Bond, now! You have a lot of energy for a dead man, Mr. Bond. Honorable mention on Her Majesty's Secret Service.
cast was spot on. Diane Rigg as love interest Cortessa DiVincenzo and Telly Savalas as arch nemesis Lopo. But after Sean Connery pulled out of the Bond film, at least temporarily, it was George Lazenby to fit the bill. Lazenby would end up playing the part of Bond only once. And for many Bond aficionados, it was good riddance. Though I disagree. Lazenby had big shoes to fill and does quite a nice job considering this is his first feature film. When Bond meets Contessa, he falls in love and eventually marries her. She ends up in Blofeld's clutches. Bond manages to rescue her, but as they drive away in his Aston Martin, she is killed by Blofeld in a drive-by shooting. Blofeld. Blofeld. There's no hurry, you see. You have all the time in the world. Though on Her Majesty's Secret Service is only an honorable mention, the absolutely lovely Diana Rigg is one of my favorite Bond girls, as capable as she is beautiful, and delivers a standout performance. Number 8. Live and Let Die. Released in 1973, it was the eighth Bond film and the first starring Roger Moore. After three British agents are murdered, Bond is sent to the United States to find out what happened. He finds himself immersed in a world of drug trafficking, gangsters, and voodoo, facing off against a formidable drug baron known on the streets as Mr. Big. The film which was released during the height of the black exploitation era of Hollywood filmmaking was the first to feature an African American Bond girl involved in an intimate relationship with the agent, the sultry Gloria Hendry in the role of Rosie Carver, also starring Jane Seymour in her film debut as the beautiful tarot card reader Solitaire, whose destiny is intertwined with none other than 007's. before it was given. Strangely enough, somehow, so did I. Perhaps the most memorable scene featured in Live and Let Die is Bond skipping across the backs of five crocodiles, a scene I was thrilled by as a child and still get a big kick out of it every time I see it. A man comes. He travels quickly. He has purpose. He comes over water. He travels with others. He will oppose. He brings violence and destruction. Any cost, any bond must die. Number seven. Spy Who Loved Me. I tried to hide from your love me. Above me. The spy who loved me. When a Royal Navy Polaris submarine equipped with 16 nuclear warheads goes missing, 
It's up to MI6's 007 to find it. His rival is a beautiful KGB agent whose lover he's killed, who's dispatched to find out what's happened to a Russian submarine that's also mysteriously vanished. KGB agent Triple X is played by the lovely and sexy Barbara Bach, easily James Bond's equal and another of my favorite Bond girls. One of the more memorable features of the film was a car that transformed into a submarine. Seven different models of the Lotus Esprit were used for the elaborate sequence. One was a mock-up shell, another was a fully functioning submarine. The bubbles coming out of the vehicle as it plunges into the water are the result of a lot of Alka-Seltzer tablets. Other than Blofeld, who was played by quite a few different actors, Jaws, most memorably played by Richard Keel, is one of the only reoccurring Bond villains. First appearing in The Spy Who Loved Me and reappearing in Moonraker, Jaws is often mentioned whenever discussing more era Bond films. Though the second film to feature Roger Moore as James Bond, The Man with the Golden Gun, was a box office flop, James Bond was back with a vengeance in The Spy Who Loved Me. Well, well, well. A British agent in love with a Russian agent. Detente indeed. Every person who even comes into contact with that microphone is to be eliminated. Number six, for your eyes only. Tale of Revenge and its Consequences For Your Eyes Only saw Bond in a race to recover a missile command system that went missing after the accidental sinking of a spy trawler. He must face off against the Russians, who are desperate to find the device before Bond does. Add in feuding Greek businessman and a beautiful woman hell-bent on avenging the death of her murdered parents, and the result is non-stop, heart-pounding action. Compared to previous more Bond films, for Your Eyes Only focuses less on gadgets and camp and more on dramatic storytelling and intense action. The grittiest Bond film to feature Roger Moore and my absolute favorite of his films. You left this with Ferrara, I believe. Bernard Lee, who starred as M in the previous 11 Bond films, died in January 1981 after filming had started on For Your Eyes Only. Out of respect, no new actor was hired to fill his wingtips. Before setting out on revenge, you first dig two graves. I'll go back and wait, but not for long. It won't be, I swear. Sir Roger Moore was not only the longest serving Bond actor, having spent 12 years in the role from Live and Let Die in 1973 through 1985's A View to a Kill, but he also was the oldest 007, making his debut in the role at 45 and finally bowing out when he was 58. And there was no doubting his popularity. Moore was voted Best Bond in an Academy Awards poll in 2004 and won with 62% of the votes in another survey four years later. The man with the golden pun, always ready with a one-liner, and showing off a casual nature towards women that is politically incorrect to many modern viewers, he played the debonair playboy spy for all it's worth. 
Roger Moore's natural charm and charisma has left an indelible mark on the 007 franchise that will always be remembered fondly. You have a very good memory for faces. And figures. Bottoms up. Look after Mr. Bond. See that some harm comes to him. There never has been. Oh, James. There never will be. Oh, James. Anybody but you. Nobody does it. What's Bond doing? I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. You're not thinking that. I sure am, boy. What do you think you're doing? Keeping the British hand up, sir. Honorable mention, never say never again. Renegade Bond film. After Sean Connery hung up his tux after filming Diamonds Are Forever in 1971, he publicly stated he would never again play the role of James Bond. Fast forward 12 years later, and he was convinced by writer-producer Kevin McClory, who had won the film rights to Fleming's novel Thunderball after a protracted legal battle, to dust off his tuxedo. The film was essentially a remake of the earlier film Thunderball with a nod to Connery's return by calling it Never Say Never Again. The storyline centers on an aging Bond. Connery was 52 when the film was made. He was called back into action to investigate after two nuclear weapons are stolen. Even though Connery returned to the role he set the tone for, and Never Say Never Again included a stellar cast, such as the sexy Kim Basinger as resident Bond girl Domino, and Max von Sydow as Blofeld, Never Say Never Again failed to gross as much as the official Bond film released earlier the same year, Roger Moore's Octopussy. Albert Covey Broccoli and Harry Stoltzman had been the producers of the Bond films from 007's first transition from page to screen since 1962's Dr. No, and had a real passion for the Bond series, especially Covey Broccoli, who remained with the 007 franchise up till Piers Brosnan was cast in Goldeneye. Subsequent Bond films were produced by Broccoli's daughter, Barbara. Initially, Roger Moore hadn't planned to be involved in another Bond film after Moonraker, but was convinced by friend John Glenn and director of For Your Eyes Only to reprise the role, as this was his directorial debut, and he didn't want to contend with a new Bond on top of an already full plate. When Octopussy went into pre-production, a new Bond was cast. Actor James Brolin was to be the successor to the long-running series, but when Cubby Broccoli got wind of the aforementioned rival Bond film starring original 007, Sean Connery, they ditched Brolin and yet again convinced Roger Moore to return as Bond. As Broccoli rightfully felt that Brolin didn't stand a chance competing with the original Bond, and so oddly enough, 1983 became the Battle of the Bonds. Though Octopussy racked up more at the box office, personally, I feel Never Say Never Again is the better Bond film. Number 5, The Living Daylight. In Timothy Dalton's first turn as Agent 007, Bond is assigned to help a KGB officer defect from the Soviet Union. The officer reveals that the KGB has revived a long-dead policy of killing British and American agents. Bond's adventures have him traversing the globe, eventually facing off with an evil arms dealer determined to start another world war. Dalton received mostly praise for his role as Bond, particularly because he performed most of his own stunts. Some criticized him for his lack of humor, something the previous Bond, Roger Moore, was known for. Dalton's no-nonsense approach to Bond was a grittier new take on the character that harkened back not only to the Sean Connery era of Bond, but the original Ian Fleming novel.
It's all so boring here, Margot. There's nothing but playboys and tennis pros. If only I could find a real man. I need to use your phone. She'll call you back. Who are you? Bond, James Bond. Number four, License to Kill. Darker and more violent than previous Bond films, License to Kill has Bond going rogue when he's suspended from MI6 to exact revenge on a drug lord who tortured his best friend, CIA agent Felix Leiter, and murdered the agent's new bride. The film originally was titled License Revoked and is the first official Bond film with a title not taken from 007's creator Ian Fleming. Bond girl Pam Bulliver was played by actress Casey Lowell, who is perhaps best known as prosecutor Jamie Ross on the long-running TV drama Law and & Order, and Talisa Soto, who's probably best known for her role as Lady Katana in the Mortal Kombat film series. License to Kill, released during the summer months, was one of the franchise's least commercially successful films likely because it faced stiff competition at the box office, including Batman, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and Lethal Weapon 2. Since then, all Bond movies have been released in the fall or winter. Unfortunately, License to Kill would mark the final appearance of Timothy Dalton as 007. In my opinion, Dalton doesn't receive enough praise for portraying the character a bit more rough around the edges, more tougher and grittier, than previous portrayals, something current actor Daniel Craig as Bond has continued to do in his own way and has received tons of critical acclaim for. But as they say, timing is everything, and perhaps Dalton's Bond was a little too ahead of its time. Give immediately. Your license to kill is revoked. Could have had everything. Don't you want to know why? Number three, Golden Eye. Feel his breath. Golden Eye. I found his weakness. Golden Eye. You do what I please. Golden Eye. Here's Brosnan burst onto the big screen as Bond after the franchise was forced to take a six-year hiatus, the longest gap in the series' history. Because of legal disputes, GoldenEye was the first 007 movie that was not based on the works of Bond creator Ian Fleming. It also was the first filmed in the post-Cold War era and the first to feature a woman in the role as M, the formidable British actress Judi Dench. You don't like me, Bond. You don't like my methods. You think I'm an accountant, a bean counter, more interested in my numbers than your instincts. The thought had occurred to me. Good. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, a relic of the Cold War, whose boyish charms, though wasted on me, obviously appeal to that young woman I sent out to evaluate you. Point taken. Not quite, 007. If you think for one moment I don't have the balls to send a man out to die, your instincts are dead wrong. Actress Lois Maxwell, who played the original Miss Moneypenny, claims to have come up with the idea of a female M. Maxwell's original concept was for Miss Moneypenny to have been promoted into the position, and in a surprise reveal to the audience, Bond would have entered M's office like any other Bond film, and from behind the desk, a backwards chair would have swirled around to reveal Miss Moneypenny as the new M. Secretary Miss Moneypenny was crushing on the smooth-talking spy from the get-go. 
The pair enjoyed an easy banter and affection, but to her disappointment, romance was never in the cards. Though Miss Moneypenny as 007 Superior would have been an interesting dynamic for the series to explore, I'm more than happy with Judy Dench as M. It's unfortunate that Lois Maxwell is uncredited with the idea of a female M, but Judy Dench's stern portrayal of M is undeniably the most unique and memorable. Another noteworthy performance is that of the stunningly attractive Femke Jensen as Femme Fatale Zenya Onatop. <sighs> When the GoldenEye nuclear satellite weapon falls into the wrong hands, Bond must stop it from being used in London to create a total financial crisis. GoldenEye's script was reworked multiple times during the shoot when producers learned the storyline was strikingly similar to that of True Lies, the Arnold Schwarzenegger film in production at the same time. Brosnan was actually in line for the role of Bond after Roger Moore left the series, but was held to a contract with CBS, where he portrayed the title character on the hit TV series, Remington Steel. Brosnan had something of a whiplash experience while driving on the freeway and saw a giant billboard for the living daylights starring the new Bond, Timothy Dalton. But as they say, some things are worth the wait, as Brosnan managed to secure the role a mite longer than Dalton did. England is about to learn the cost of betrayal. God save the Queen. Trust me. Bond. Only Bond. Grab it! <laughs> Honorable mention, Tomorrow Never Dies. Sinister media mogul Elliot Carver wants to establish a media empire, but he has to get the rights to broadcast in China first. Carver attempts to start a war between China and the UK in order to dominate the world media market and get the scoop of a lifetime. Of course, Bond must stop him, but there's a catch. Carver's wife is Bond's former lover, Paris, played by the lovely Terry Hatcher. Another of my favorite Bond girls, Hatcher, probably best known for her role on the hit TV series Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, where Hatcher delivered a most memorable turn as Daily Planet reporter Lois Lane. Anthony Hopkins was originally cast as Elliot Carver, but he bailed on the film after three days because the set was so chaotic and there was no finished script. The role went instead to Jonathan Price. Though a few other actors have lent their talents to the role of Gadget Master Q, the man most commonly associated with the role would be Desmond Llewellyn, setting the tone for the role and cementing his place in history alongside 007s, having played the role of Q a whopping 17 times. Llewellyn's final portrayal of the role of Q is in Tomorrow Never Dies' follow-up, The World Is Not Enough. Do you need collision coverage? Yes. Fire? Probably. Property destruction? Accidents do happen. They frequently do. Whoa. When you remove Mr. Bond's heart, there should just be enough time for him to watch it stop beating. I would have thought watching your TV shows was torture enough. Welcome to my world crisis, Mr. Bond. I have a backup plan. So do I. Would you please kill those bastards? Number two. Casino Royale.
Although Casino Royale was the 21st movie released by Ian Productions, this James Bond film actually was based on author Ian Fleming's first novel, written in 1953, about the MI6 agent. The movie goes back in time to depict Bond's first mission as Agent 007. In the film, Bond prevents a terrorist attack at Miami International Airport. After successfully thwarting that plot, the agent sets out to bankrupt a wealthy weapons dealer in a high-stakes game of poker. Although Craig, at first, was hesitant to take on the role as Bond, he threw himself fully into the job once he signed on to play the agent 007. He quit smoking, gained 20 pounds of muscle, and performed many of his own stunts. While 007 manages to win at the poker table, the beautiful Ava Green, as Vesper Lind, another of my favorite Bond girls, manages to win the agent's heart. More than 200 actors were considered to take over the coveted role of 007 from Piers Brosnan before Daniel Craig was tapped for the part. The most interesting actor considered is Henry Cavill, who's now playing Superman for the DC Cinematic Universe. Who is it? 007. Bond's been poisoned. He's going into cardiac arrest. I'm sorry. That last hand nearly killed me. Who is this? Bond. Number one, Skyfall. Bond must locate a computer drive that contains a list of British agents on it. The British government is furious that MI6 let the drive fall into the wrong hands and blames M played for the last time by Judy Dench. Bond sets off to find the drive and learns that the man who has it holds a personal grudge against M and is out to destroy her. What are you going to do now? Take me back to her? All on your own. <laughs> this is a moment yet. Ladies and gentlemen, Javier Bardem plays the villainous Silva and carries on a time-honored tradition of deadly and diabolical Bond villains. Skyfall earned a staggering $1 billion internationally at the box office, making it the highest grossing Bond flick of all time. I want to meet your employer. Be careful of what you wish for, Mr. Bond. James Bond. How much do you know about fear? All there is. Not like this. Not like him. He loved fast, exotic cars, expensive travel, and courted a succession of gorgeous women while enjoying his dry martinis and a 70-a-day cigarette habit. Sound familiar? While this could easily be a description of James Bond, it's perhaps not so surprising that it's actually 007's creator, Ian Fleming, who shared many of the more flamboyant traits of his literary alter ego. While many of his novels may now gather dust on shelves or in secondhand shops, Fleming's Bond lives on in the movies as a cultural touchstone 
to a bygone era when a fast car, a beautiful woman, and a martini shaken, not stirred, were absolutely required for saving the world. Besides the aforementioned Austin Powers series, James Bond has had a major influence on many other film franchises, including Get Smart, Mission Impossible, The Bourne series, and personal favorite, Atomic Blonde. And I'm sure 007's influence will continue for many more years to come, as another Bond film is in the works with Daniel Craig slated to return sometime in the near future. James Bond is the longest running film series in history and shows no sign of slowing down and I wouldn't want it any other way. It'd be a pretty cold bastard who didn't want revenge for the death of someone he loved. I thought I could trust you. You said you weren't motivated by revenge. When you can't tell your friends from your enemies, it's time to go. The name's Bond. James Bond. Tell me what you know of James Bond. He's a double O and a wild one. Charming, sophisticated secret agent. Some men are coming to kill us. We're going to kill them first. Thanks for letting your geek flag fly with Mad About Superheroes. Let me know in the comments down below what your favorite Bond films are. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and check out these other cool videos right here.